Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello and welcome back. This is Tim Fisher from Purdue University, and we are on lecture five of week one in the course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. This is a Nano Hub U course. Um, and today we're going to go back to pick up some other details of phonons. What we did the last time was to look at a monatomic atomic chain. So every atom was the same in this atomic chain. And now we want to add a little bit of complexity that I hope will help you to understand uh, what measures you have to take, especially for accounting of uh, different atoms when you actually have to pull together a big simulation. Um, at least the beginnings of that. We're not going to do a big simulation, but we're going to at least start the, the process of accounting for these different um, possibilities of different masses or spring constants and such, different directions, for example. So if we go back to our simple equation for lattice dynamics, this was for a one-dimensional atomic chain where every atom was the same, every spring constant was the same, it had a spring constant of g. Now we need to imagine, well, maybe the masses differ or the spring constant differs, and how would we handle that? We have a discrete equation here. So these subscripts on U, U are the U's are the uh, atomic displacements at sites N, N minus 1, N plus 1. And so this is a discrete equation. Now we have to think about what we would need to do to add uh, differences in mass or differences in spring constant or differences in direction so things can vibrate in multiple directions. The example that we'll do at the end of this lecture just considers the effect of, of variations in mass. So the way to do that generally, the, to handle it generally, is to create something called the dynamical matrix and today I hope to teach you a little bit about what that dynamical matrix means and where it comes from. So if we go back to our uh, Newton's second law, uh, force F equals MA, mass times the second time derivative of displacement. So that's really what this equation says. And what we're going to try to do is to pick out a, we're going to try to pick out a, a part of this where we can relate force to a matrix that contains all kinds of variables and subscripts and superscripts. I'll explain what those are in a moment multiplied by the, this, the displacement. Ultimately, what we're going to end up with is an eigenvalue problem. So let's go through these subscripts and superscripts. The M's and the N's, those represent unit cell locations, so the, the indices of the unit cell. So now we're, when we have the possibility that, that uh, a force can span across unit cells, we need to make sure we're keeping track of, of which one is which. And then alpha and beta are the basis indices. So that's within a unit cell. Are we talking about the first atom, the primary atom, or the basis atom? So we have to keep track of that as well. Lastly, I and J are the dimensions, or directions rather. You can think of those as being the three Cartesian directions for a three-dimensional problem. We're just going to use, still use one dimension today, but this is where you would add the dimensionality. This matrix phi contains the spring constants in some form. Um, and there can be some atomic mass information that's embedded in it. Um, and it's normally diagonally dominant because if we go down the diagonal, again, these are this is atom N alpha, right? And so we think that the atom M beta, if it's close to N alpha, will have a significant force constant or spring constant between itself and the N alpha atom. But as I get farther away from that atom, we think that that force constant will go away, will, will diminish down to zero. And in our case, we're only going to worry about nearest neighbor. So it's really only the two atoms on either side. So what we're going to do to, to solve this problem is, again, go back to our plane wave solution, which served us so well when we had an atomic chain that was looped on itself, um, and also our electrons. We used a, a plane wave solution for the steady Schrodinger equation as well. We'll do that again. Um, these, I, I will mention that the unit cell indices are not, at least both of them are not necessary because the translational invariance of perfect crystal says that I can just pick one unit cell and then reference everything else to that one. And so we're going to actually call that unit cell the zero cell here. And I will show you where we, where we apply that. That's given 
right here, and then P, the index P just above that, that will be what iterates through the nearest neighbor unit cells and, and beyond, in which case the, the interaction will be zero. But we also have this, from the plane wave solution, we have a, a vector, R sub P, that connects the unit cell zero with whatever unit cell the uh, beta atom, the P beta atom, is sitting in. So uh, that's, that's a nuance. Um, and again, the spring constant matrix has to be multiplied by the, uh, by the plane wave form of the solution. And there's also an applied summation over this. So again, we're interested here in the atom alpha, right? And now we're just worried about whether that's the first or second atom in our unit, in our zero unit cell. Um, but it, we will have to sum up different interactions from terms within the unit, its own unit cell and possibly from without, from other unit cells. All right, so um, in, here, in this case, U tilde is the amplitude of displacement. It's time invariant, um, and we already talked about RP. So um, I think we're, we're ready to go. What we'll find, and what we do find, is that this grouping of terms, the grouping of terms that's sitting right here, pre-multiplying the atomic displacement amplitude, that we will call the dynamical matrix. And so we pulled that out and identified that, um, and we will we'll go through and calculate it for a, a, an example problem here in just a little bit. What we want to do with that equation, you'll notice that it was an eigenvalue equation where omega squared are the eigenvalues, right? And so when we have at least some simple matrices, we can actually use um, a determinant solution for that, and, and that's what we're going to do. We, we will have some simple solutions, but essentially what we want to do with this equation is to calculate omega as a function of k, the wave vector. So that's going to give us back our dispersion relation for this other problem. So the other problem being one in which we might have different masses and different spring constants and different dimensions. So we're still allowing for all of those possibilities. Here's our example problem and we have in this two masses, M1 and M2. I will stipulate that M2 is larger than M1 but the spring constants are all the same because every spring constant is connecting an M1 atom and an M2 atom. So there are, another, are no other uh, possible spring constant. We can only have one. One big difference from what we did before is that the lattice constant A now spans across two atoms because we have two atoms per unit cell and so in essence it's twice as big as what we had for the monatomic chain of atoms. We go back to our expression for the uh, potential energy, the harmonic potential energy. In this case we have other terms these other terms come from the fact that in each unit cell we have two atoms and so the M2 atom will be interacting with an M1 atom on its right and M1 atom on its left and the M1 atom will be interacting with an M2 atom on its left and an M2 atom on its right and we have to include all of those terms and then sum over everything to get the full harmonic potential. Now if we do this calculation, if we, if we take um, our expressions for relating the harmonic potential to the force um, and then what, how we've defined the phi matrix, that force constant matrix before, what we find is that the diagonal elements of the phi matrix are 2 times g, that's the spring constant, and then the nearest off diagonal elements are minus g, everything else would be 0. In this problem we only have a 2 by 2 matrix, so the diagonal elements will be 2g, off diagonals will be minus g. And I wanted to give you just an idea of, of kind of where this comes from. So if we look at at this relationship between force, this is what we had earlier. Force equals our phi matrix times the displacement vector, um, and that's going to be equal mass times uh, acceleration. So if we go back to this and kind of look at, at this from the fundamentals, let's go back to when we were thinking about two atoms connected by a bond. We said that the potential energy, at least the harmonic potential energy, could be represented as one-half times the spring constant times u squared, where u was the perturbation away from some equilibrium value of their separation. Well, now if we say that F, the force, equals minus the partial 
of u, this is the uh, potential energy, with respect to u, the displacement, right? Well, if we just simply calculate this, that will equal minus g times u. Well, that looks very similar to what we have here for this phi times u. In this case, it would imply that this phi term would equal the spring constant. So we said that when we were focused on the diagonal elements, that means that you know how do how do the atoms interact with with themselves and with the things nearest to them? We said that 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 those diagonal terms would be two times g. In this case, we've only come up with g, uh, a single g. But notice that in our problem, in fact, we have we're actually dealing with an atom that will have a bond on the left and the right. So here's g. And here's G. So if this is our atom of focus, let's just say that that's the atom we're focusing on, then its phi element will be 2 times G. And then everything else that comes in, those minus Gs in the off diagonal terms, what they're doing is really accounting for the displacements of the other atoms, of the neighboring atoms, relative to the displacement of this atom. So we're kind of, the 2G sort of represents the case where if the, if the atom if the side atoms, the nearest neighbor atoms, were fixed, they weren't moving at all, then I'd have uh, 2g times the displacement u uh, for this for this term, or really we'd have one half 2 times g times u squared for the potential energy. Um, and then we correct for that in the off diagonal terms based on the, the location of the of the neighboring atoms. So now we can go back and we can substitute all of these values into our dynamical matrix which we defined earlier. You'll notice that the diagonal terms have that 2g um, and so the diagonal terms correspond to alpha equals beta so those are the same masses um, m1 in the 1 1 location and m2 in the 2 2 location of the matrix. The off diagonal terms have these minus g's as we had discussed before but they also have, again, a couple of terms here. So this 1 plus e to the ik, we have two of those types of terms. There's a summation over p. So essentially what we're doing here is we're summing over, uh, over these other unit cells. So the first sum is when the unit cell is the same. That's the zero unit cell. So we get a value of 1. e to the i times 0 is just 1. The second term, that's the e to the ik term, comes from when we have a different unit cell interacting with our atom. So that's where this whole dynamical matrix, those are where the terms come from. I think it should be pretty um, clear, although it's always dangerous for me to say that. The best thing to do is to, on your own, go through some of the math. What we want to do now is to apply this secular equation, um, the determinant of a, the dynamical matrix minus our eigenvalue, that's omega squared, times the identity matrix. That's how we're going to solve for frequency omega in terms of k, wave vector k. And we find that we have a quartic equation, omega to the fourth, because again we have a two by two matrix having omega squared on the diagonal. So we're going to have an omega to the fourth. This is really our dispersion relation. What we want to do is we want to cast that back into at least an omega squared form. We do that with a simple quadratic reduction and what we find is something that's you know, pretty similar to what we had for the monatomic chain. But there's one really big difference, and that is that we have, sorry, here we have a plus or minus sign. So that means that we actually can have two branches. And so the minus sign on this we'll put as a subscript. So that's, this is the, the minus branch of omega. And then over here on this side, we have the plus branch. Okay, and we're look, we're taking some limiting forms here. So let's think about this this minus branch. The minus branch has omega as k goes to zero. Omega is proportional to k. But we've seen that before. That's a linear relationship between the two. And then as uh, as k goes to the edge of the first Brillouin zone, that's at pi over a we find that omega goes to the square root of g over one of the masses. So that's also similar to what we had before that was 
there was a square root of g over m that was sort of the limiting maximum frequency. In this case, remember, m2 is larger than m1, which means that this frequency, omega minus of this branch, is going to be lower than the corresponding limiting frequency when k equals pi over a, again at the edge of the Brillouin zone. This branch will have a somewhat higher frequency at that edge. But most importantly, as k goes to zero for this positive branch, we find that the frequency does not go to zero. It's, it's not proportional to k anymore. We have a finite frequency at zero wave vector, which means that when we have an infinite wavelength, we have still a finite frequency. And that takes some, some thinking about and some reasoning to understand. And we'll go through that a little bit. But I will note that, in essence, these two branches, one of them is very much like what we had before, and the other one is new. If we plot these out, we see that the bottom branch, this is the omega minus branch that I'm scrolling over right now, that's the acoustic branch once again. It looks very similar to what we had before for the monatomic chain. It's a quarter sine wave or very close to a quarter sine wave. In this case, we've chosen the M2 to be 2 times M1. So we've, that's given us some, some detailed quantitative information here. If we change those masses, the curves would change a bit. Uh, but this top curve is the one that's new, and we call that the optical branch. And we'll, we'll deal with that in a number of different ways as we go through the course, but I want to I highlight a couple of things. The first, the first thing is the optical branch is very flat. Right? And so if, if you recall, the group velocity, that's the velocity with which energy is transported. The group velocity is the derivative of frequency with respect to wave vector. That's generally going to be quite low for the optical branch. And in fact, many people will ignore it completely. Many assumptions um, that people make along the way just sort of ignores the transport behavior of, of the optical branch. Uh, the second thing is that it's at a significantly higher energy all across the board which means that its occupation will be lower. We haven't talked about statistics yet. We'll do that next week. But it will have fewer phonons occupied in these, in these allowed states up here than we have for the acoustic branch. And that's going to affect how it stores energy, certainly how it transports energy. And we'll go through all of these nuances um, as we move forward in the course. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to talking to you next time.